Marcus Bookstore presents Mr. John William Templeton. Today, Mr. Templeton debuts his new book, Cakewalk, the untold story of the power and influence of African Americans in the entertainment industry here in San Francisco at the turn of the 20th century. And now, here's John Templeton. We're, we're looking at black men who were porters from the Midwest who came out here and they basically uh, dominated entertainment in the entertainment hub of the Western United States. And they were so successful that their building was the first building we built after the earthquake. So, so knowing these facts, you know, I'm just kind of thinking, okay, now what kind of people did these have to be in order to do that? What kind of interchanges did they have? What was their relationship with the, the generals and the politicians and that sort of thing? So I'm basically trying to fill in you know, sort of like having a watercolor and painting, painting in them. So I'm basically trying to give some texture to these people uh, using the information that we you know. Check one. A bullet whizzed by the shoulder of Louis Lou Purcell, clanged into the lead plate behind the brick wall, behind the bar, and ricocheted past his other shoulder to shatter a glass in the hand of his trusted barkeep, Lester Mapp. Neither moved. There had been 2,000 retail liquor establishments licensed in San Francisco, and just as many illegal speakeasies. Most catered to distinct communities of migrants to the port city. Portuguese fishermen had their own spots, as did us. Australian miners or Chinese merchants. But the resorts opened by black entrepreneurs like Purcell and his partner Sam King had catered to everyone, regardless of skin color, ever since the 1840s. Because of their rare integration, they had become known as black and tans. One place was known as the most famous black and tan in the country, Purcell So Different, aided in no small part by Purcell's fellow Pullman porters who convinced every likely customer on the Intercontinental Railroad lines that their trip to San Francisco would be incomplete without a visit to the women dance and drink a Purcell so different. Midway in the 500 block of Pacific Street, two blocks from the waterfront, Purcell's was the hub of the international district. Purcell had leased the building from another black entrepreneur who had built it in the 1880s. Other black run resorts had been on the site since 1850. Nothing was taboo in Purcell's except not paying for service. Gunfire was a daily occurrence. Purcell chuckled to himself. Drunks are lousy shots, as he continued the tally. A soldier from Tennessee, who 40 years earlier would have been in the Confederate service, had fired the bullets after watching the object of his attentions dance to Grizzly Bear with a colored man. We'd string you up in Tennessee, the soldier crowed to a half dozen of his fellow soldiers. Just then, 30 members of the Odd Fellows formed a circle around him. Can you gladly inform these gentlemen that they are not in Tennessee? Purcell boomed in his distinctive baritone voice. Two of the odd fellows grabbed the shooter under his arms and pushed him out the front door. His friends followed quickly. They spotted Chief Jesse B. Cook, leader of the San Francisco Police Department in the dirt street outside. He listened to their story of white women dancing with black men in very close proximity and then disappearing after enough drinks had been purchased. Cook agreed with them. It had to be stopped before it spread across the country. But Purcell had too many friends in high places. This can never go down in history, that it happened while I was police chief, said Cook. One day I'm going to shut them all down. The chief glared across the dusty road. All around him was ruin, twisted wood and brick left in the wake of the earthquake and fire that burned down the entire downtown. His counterpart, his fire chief, had been killed by a falling beam on the first day of the tragedy. City Hall was de destroyed. A commanding general from the Presidio had effectively become the mayor of the city, having deployed thousands of soldiers to patrol the street, deliver food, and provide health care. Cook was seen essentially as a tour guide for the soldiers who had streamed into the city. His force was in about as bad a shape as City Hall. Those officers who continued to work usually had no place left to live, 
huddled in tent camps like most of the rest of the residents. Purcell and King had been part of the Presidio culture for a decade since they had opened HQ outside the gates of the Army Fort in 1895. It was the same year that Burt Williams and George Walker met on Market Street to become the fabled team of Williams and Walker, and just three years after Jack Johnson won a 62-round boxing match in San Francisco. HQ had become the preferred watering hole for the 9th and 10th Cavalry Troopers and their white officers like Black Jack Pershing. There was a natural affinity between Pullman porters like Purcell and King, who had left their native Iowa, and the Buffalo Soldier regiments, mostly made of Southern soldiers. Unlike most of their fellow black men, both groups had mobility, access to information, and some limited power. Rather than put up with the petty racial insults common in the post-Reconstruction era, they found comfort in a place that was black-owned, without minstrel caricatures, as the entertainment. HQ and the Arcadia Club that followed it were famous as places where black men could be men. The bars practically became recruiting tools for four black regiments who cycled in and out of the Presidio, either patrolling the national parks or heading off to duty in the Spanish-American War. By 1901, Purcell and King were so successful that they took the extraordinary step of opening a club on Pacific Street, the entertainment capital of the Waterfront District, and naming it after themselves. Presidio soldiers continued to be their leading clientele. In July 1906, there was no more valuable clientele for, mer for miles around. So the information about uh, the real origin of jazz music uh, is, you know, quite detailed. But because the first thing that everybody says is, I thought jazz started in New Orleans. So, uh, because people have that locked in their head, information like, you know, there's, there's a book called The Jazz Encyclopedia, and it says that uh, jazz basically started in New Orleans around 1917 when they first started using the term there. And then on the next page it says, but the first print reference to jazz was in 1913 in the San Francisco newspaper. And they don't... <laughs> they don't, they don't, you know, address the obvious contradiction in their own uh, uh, narrative. So, uh, so what I've done is basically go back through the, the primary sources. So, we've actually uh, read page by page every black newspaper uh, that's been printed in San Francisco from 1857 to 1985. Uh, there's a project, the Works Project. Progress Administration did in the 1930s where they chronicled every concert and dramatic performance that happened in San Francisco from, from 1848 to 1930. So, so you can actually track this information and, and one of the things we saw on the tour this morning was a, um, a plaque on Post Street that has, you know, uh, the California Theater and it has the performers, and all the performers have demonstrably curly hair. Now, this is a bronze plaque, so they went to some effort to make sure that when you looked at this plaque, the first thing you would say is those must have been black folks. And so, so the evidence is all around about the central role that African Americans played in entertainment in San Francisco. But because people have such, you know, misconceptions embedded in what they believe, uh, people have ignored the uh, evidence. So that's the level of detail that we've had to go to to uh, do this. So.